Oh man, this video took over a kilocore to create. A kilocore, what's that? Over a thousand cores. And this is really, it's, we're gonna talk a little bit about Linux, but this is general problem solving and good computer science. So we can talk about it in general terms, but there's a special video coming up on the Linux channel that's gonna cover a lot more. But a kilocore, has that got your attention? So the machine behind me is remoted into a machine that you can probably hear. That's the build server. It's a 128 core monster. That's one implementation of our dual 7763, but I don't think it's gonna work outside the data center. It's very loud. You hear that low hum of servers in the background of some videos? I've been working on this for a while, and the, the short version is that the process of problem solving is probably the most important thing to understand. And the specific problem that I've been working on is compiling the Linux kernel faster. How do we do that? Well, not so much the nuts and bolts, but what hardware do we have? What uh, sort of metrics can we collect to actually do this? If you look at some of our other videos and some of the other videos that we've covered in the past, one of the things we've been really excited about is, oh my gosh, we're compiling the Linux kernel in 20 seconds. And that's basically accurate. But there's kind of a floor that you hit where compiling the Linux kernel, no matter what your hardware is, is about 20 seconds. And there's a whole other project that is around optimizing it so that it takes less than 20 seconds to compile the kernel. But that's all well and good, but we're not there yet and it doesn't really have anything to do with current DevOps of the Linux kernel. Because if you get into a project like the Linux kernel and you need to do DevOps, chances are you're not gonna convince your manager that you should completely retool the way that headers work in order to make the build system faster, in order to you know, be able to do more awesome work. And even if you did convince your manager that that was a good idea, chances are they're not gonna do that to the past versions of your product that you've released. So the question was, how can we build the Linux kernel with all of the modules? I assure you, that's not going to take 20 seconds. Of course, if you're watching this in the far future, maybe it will take 20 seconds and we'll all be really excited. But for me, I've already sort of been tackling this problem in other uh, versions. We did some videos on building open embedded with various different systems. And one of the very surprising things about building open embedded is that it didn't necessarily scale the more hardware that you threw at it. And what I mean by that is if we had a single 32 core system and we scaled it up to be 64 cores, we didn't get a doubling in performance, meaning that you know building open embedded, all of the universe of open embedded would take uh, you know half as much time. Now with the Linux kernel, it was, it was a little more interesting than that. It would take less time, not half as much time, but proportionally it did better than open embedded. It also did better than Chromium. And that's just because I think of the geometry of the Linux kernel. It's a bunch of really small device drivers. Maybe a lot of things can actually be cached. So when you look at a problem like this, you look at, okay, what's the source material? Does this need to come from a RAM disk? Does that make a bigger difference? So building the Linux kernel with all of its modules was sort of the first thing that we set out to do. Well, fortunately, we're not the only people thinking about this. There's KC Bench. KC Bench is an awesome utility. A lot of people, a lot smarter than I am, have put together in order to be able to do these kind of performance benchmarks. And you run KC Bench, and it tells you about how many kernels per hour that you can expect in your system. And by default, out of the box, it uses a very old version of the Linux kernel. So old, it doesn't compile with the version of the compiler that comes with Manjaro, which Manjaro is what I used for the actual kernel testing in this video. But fortunately, you can specify dash S on the command line, and if you want to repeat what I've done here, you can use dash S 5.17 and build the Linux kernel 5.17. And if you run KCBench dash, dash S 5.17, you'll get some pretty reasonable numbers, and it'll probably tell you that you're gonna do on the order of 100 kernels per hour on any reasonable modern system. That's, that's pretty impressive. But if you do dash M, that does the all module config. So it's going to build basically everything available in the kernel as modules. And we're talking about a much more uh, robust 
<laughs> girthy uh, <laughs> code base and it takes a lot more time to compile. So you do the worst case scenario and oh, all of a sudden that 32 core monster Threadripper Pro system, it's only gonna manage about 10 kernels an hour. Well, fortunately, I've got a Xeon 8380, a dual processor Xeon 8380. That's 160 threads. We can throw that at this and we can see what kind of a job that we get. And it's also spreading from one to two sockets. So if we take a look at our results from two sockets on the Xeon system here, wow, we've really sped things up. We're getting 16, 18 kernels an hour, almost 20 kernels an hour with all of the modules on this platform. Didn't have to do anything from RAM disk. It really didn't make much of a difference. I could maybe get another half a kernel out if I used a RAM disk instead of uh, doing it from disk. But when we're doing this, it tends to chew through a lot of memory. It also estimates how many kernels per hour you could get. So those are back-to-back -back jobs. So it's like compile the kernel, do the next one, compile the kernel, do the next one, compile the kernel, do the next one. But something in the back of my mind was screaming, this isn't right. And that's from some of the work that I was doing on Open Embedded. So the situation when you have two CPU sockets is there's really not a lot of contention for resources if you've got two completely separate processors. You could uh, see a scenario, especially with a project like this, a DevOps type project, where having two 32 core CPUs will far outperform a single 64 core CPU. So I thought the next logical comparison might be a 64 core Threadripper Pro versus this Xeon Monster system. So if we take a quick look at the results, moving from the 32 core Threadripper Pro to the 64 core Threadripper Pro, we didn't get a doubling in performance. It's respectable to be sure, but it wasn't quite the uplift that I was hoping for. And so we did the dual Xeon system and the dual Xeon system moving from 64 cores to 40 cores times two really helped us a lot more than I thought. And it's like, well, that's just the, the monstrous craziness of the Xeon 8380s. I mean, they're 40 core monsters. I decided to also try the Epic 75 F3. These are 32 core CPUs, but also doing this in our dual socket gigabyte chassis. So two sockets, eight sticks of memory uh, per socket and the 75 F3, which is sort of the, the upper echelons of clock speed and performance, but only 32 cores per socket. Still the same monstrous 256 megs of cache, it's still the same monstrous 280 watt power budget. And yes, so we saw some really amazing scaling. Running KC Bench, it tells us we can expect about 17 kernels per hour. But this is where things get interesting. If you look at this, it's running you know, 128, it's just running make with dash J 128. If you're not a developer, what that means is that it's running the kernel compile, taking one kernel and spreading it across both sockets. So it is actually creating a little bit of contention and a little bit of juggling that the host operating system, also Linux, has to deal with. The scheduler has to take things into account and has to move things around. Fortunately, the authors of KC Bench also have KC Bench Rate. I found it when I was looking into, well, what if we do two kernel compiles at once? It seems like there would be a lot of reuse there. Maybe we could compile a couple different versions of the kernel at the same time, and there would be some benefit from that. Because two separate compile jobs running across two sockets should, one would expect, to scale better than a single job running across two sockets. I mean, two sockets, don't get me wrong, it's really fast, but if the job can live entirely inside a CPU socket, entirely inside a memory footprint that exists in a single socket, then that should theoretically scale better. And yes, that actually bore out. Running KC bench rate with eight compile jobs running in parallel with 32 make threads. The dash J32 means that it's gonna run like as if you have 32 cores, but it's gonna run eight jobs in parallel. Well, we're getting 20 kernels per hour, 20 kernel compiles per hour on a 32 core system. The next question on my mind was, okay, well, we could move up to 64 cores in a socket. I've got these uh, AMD Epic 7763 CPUs, but the rub here is that the 75 F3 in terms of single and boost clock speeds will far outpace the 7763. And there's the same amount of cache and compile jobs are known to be basically cache benchmarks, especially from my experience with Open Embedded, especially with my experience with the Chromium compile. 64 cores versus 32 cores with the same amount of power budget, 280 watts per socket, and the same amount of L3 cache. I really didn't expect the 7763 to win, 
but we move from 20 kernels per hour to 30 kernels per hour. That is a 50% speed up. So doing all of our testing here with Threadripper Pro, eight sticks of memory, doing our testing in the server platforms with both Epic and the Isolate Xeons, 16 sticks of memory. So 256 gigs for the single socket systems and 512 gigs for the dual socket systems, which is pretty funny. It's basically the bottom rung configuration for servers, so. One other thing that we ran into while putting this together that I thought was pretty interesting was the uh, on-demand power scheduler. Now, on-demand is usually pretty good, but with systems this monstrous and the kind of job that a compile job is, it actually makes a pretty big difference. On our 7763 system, we would see just you know, 20, 21 compiles per hour with the on-demand scheduler set. Of course, performance makes all that go away with about 30 kernels per hour, which is really awesome. Now with a little bit of performance tuning, we can get that number on the 7763 over 30 kernels per hour. And the same is true with our 75F3. Unlocking those processors to use their full 280 watts, keeping them cool so they turbo longer, you can get 22, 23 kernels per hour. And that sort of does narrow the gap between our 32 core and our 64 core variants. So maybe when Milan X launches and we've got even more L3 cache, this might be worth repeating, but same power budget and same everything else, I really wasn't expecting that because those 75 F3 CPUs I think are better all rounder CPUs than the 7763 because of their high clock speed and because of legacy software that doesn't really usually scale all that well. And also, things have come a long way in terms of like make and the compiler and all the other componentry here. I mean, when we're talking about Manjaro, we're basically talking about the latest and greatest compilers and the latest and greatest speed ups. Uh, most of the, the innovation is happening there. They're not really super conservative with how things are implemented. So uh, yeah, I mean, you can see the GCC version that I used from the output of KC Bench and KC Bench Rate. And yeah, that, that makes a difference. If you're gonna do comparisons to this, you have to sort of keep that in mind. So there's a lot of takeaways from this and there's a lot of really important computer science. One, when you see a Linux kernel compile benchmark where the thing completes in 20 seconds, take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Maybe I can help get KC Bench and KC Bench Rate integrated into the Pharonix test suite and make the dash M option the default option for kernel compiles because that's a little bit, that's you know sort of the more meaningful side of that, I think. But the other part of this is, good lord, those 7763 processors are just unstoppable monsters, just super intimidating monsters. Now this particular system actually does have an owner. It's like the server chooses the admin, <laughs> you know, like the, I don't know, never mind. Um, and so normally this kind of a system in a rack would be good. Like you would normally expect to be able to do this. I did a lot of my testing on dual socket gigabyte chassis. But in this case, we're gonna actually build this in a desktop system around the very awesome Gigabyte motherboard. We're putting this in the torrent case, the torrent tower from Fractal, and it is a monstrous case with 180 millimeter front fans. It's not exactly rack mount, it's a little bit taller than a rack, but we're going to be able to uh, do some really amazing things with this chassis. So if you wanna see that or you wanna get into the nitty gritty of the Linux side of that, be sure to get subscribed to the Level One Linux channel. And uh, you might uh, stay tuned for that follow-up video, which is gonna be building Greg Crow Hartman's Linux build server, which is what this project was for. Uh, Wendell, this is Level One, I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level One forums.